Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody to this, uh, the third event of Manchester uh, in Translation. Uh, my name is Rob Page, I'm uh, the founder of Comma Press. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by three uh, very active and uh, activist uh, translators. Uh, today's event, uh, today's discussion is um, is uh, fighting between the lines and is um, basically asking the question about uh, uh, the role of um, the translator uh, as a as a cultural disruptor as an activist um, and uh, we're very delighted to be uh, joined by um, th three translators uh, Alex Valente, Catherine Halls and Ali Reza Abiz. Um, I'll just um, introduce everybody and then I'll ask them to kind of introduce their work a little bit more. Um, please uh, please uh, thank, join me in thanking Alex who's joining us uh, from uh, Vancouver um, and it's 3 a.m. there, so uh, uh, thank you uh, in particular, Alex, for joining us from that. Um, so to start with, Alex Valente is a literary translator originally from Prato, Italy, who translates from uh, Italian into English uh, and also dabbles with French and RPGs. He is a co-editor of the Norwich Radical. Uh, his work has been uh, published by uh, NYT Magazine, the Massachusetts Review, the Short Story Project and uh, Pen Transmissions. He's currently based uh, in, in Vancouver, as I say, or more accurately, in the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territory of the Masquam, Squamish and Tsel Watu nations. Uh, Catherine Halls is an Arabic to English translator from Cardiff, Wales. She was awarded the 2021 Penheim translation grant uh, for her translation of Haytham El Wardani's Things That Can't Be Fixed and her translation with Adam Talib uh, of Raja Alem's The Dove's Necklace received the 2017 Sheikh Hamad Award and was shortlisted for the Saith uh, Gobash Banapal Prize. Uh, her translations for the stage have been performed at the Royal Court and the Edinburgh Festival, and uh, short texts have appeared in such places as the Wo World Literature Today, Asymptote, uh, Words Without Borders, and The Critical Muslim. Uh, Ali Reza Abiz uh, is an Iranian poet, literary critic, and translator. He has written extensively on Persian contemporary literature and culture. His book, The Censorship of Literature in Post Revolutionary Iran Politics and Culture since 1979, was published. Uh, by Bloomsbury in 2020. He has published five collections of his own poetry in Persian, including London Underground, which won the 2018 Shamalu Poetry Award, and has translated uh, the poetry of uh, Raina Maria Wilker, Basil Bunton, Derek Walker, Alan Ginsberg, C.K. Williams, and others into Persian. Uh, he's also, also worked as a journalist and editor and is currently a trustee of the Poetry Translation Centre. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, as I say, the title of this uh, today's event, uh, Fighting Between the Lines, uh, Translation as Activism, um, proposes a, a bold uh, claim that uh, translators are, uh, are, can be activists. Um, and you might want to um, kind of step back from that claim a little bit and uh, temper it and talk about it in terms of cultural disruption, as I mentioned, as a uh, a kind, a way of, um, as, as a, a role that can change and uh, problematize and disrupt uh, and challenge uh, kind of prevailing narratives, um, uh, cultural narratives. But I'd just like to, to you each to sort of um, talk a little, about, a little bit about your own work, what you do and how you feel that fits into that particular role. Uh, let's, let's start with you, Catherine. Sure, thanks very much, Raf, for that introduction. And thank you again to everybody at Karma for organizing this. Um, I actually came to translation um, and to literary translation through activism, um, understood in its most kind of um, literal sense. Um, I, when I uh, learned Arabic, which is the main language I translate from, I studied for a while in Egypt and there I met various people who were sort of activists in various different kinds of causes and um, things to do with social justice, things to do with Palestine. Um, and my first experience translating was helping them out in projects they were doing that they, they needed ex exposure for in English. Um, so lots of stuff to do with Palestine, like I said, um, other things to do with um, Egypt, um, torture, for example, and repression um, that, that was going on, sadly still is going on very, very much so um, in Egypt. And then when the Egyptian revolution happened in 2011, which was shortly after I'd been uh, studying there, there was lots to be done because of course the, the eyes of the world were on Egypt um, and so I worked a lot with a kind of citizen media collective called Musirin, uh, subtitling the videos they were making and, and essentially setting up a collective uh, to do that so that we could turn these videos around really fast and get them out in English. 
Um, and it was really only after that that I came to literature, uh, which I do essentially, that's, that's most of what I do now is literature. Um, but I like to think that coming to translation uh, through that, that route has informed the way I translate and the kinds of things I'm interested in. Um, and I think we'll probably get into more of that sort of stuff later. So I'll, so I'll pass on for now. Thank you. Alex. <clears throat> Just making sure that I'm actually unmuted. Um, thank you, Ra. Uh, thank you, Common Press. Thank you, um, Catherine and Alireza. Um, could you repeat the question very briefly? <laughs> Yeah, just to, to tell us a little bit about your your role as a translator and how right. it fits into this this idea that the translator uh, can be can be an activist or can be culturally disruptive. Uh... I think when when this question was first asked on uh, um, leading up to the the, the panel, um, it, I kind of stepped back a couple more steps and just thought about like, can it is it can it be? Um, and I think the the answer that I've come up with so far, and it's probably going to change again throughout the rest of the panel, um, is translation as a process probably can be, but translation within the translation industry, within the publishing industry, is probably much harder to do anything like tangibly um, activistic or, or radical. Um, but as for my own work, like there are like small things that can be done in the process um, of translating something. And I, I mostly work with novels into English, but I have done, like I started out with translating poetry, uh, which is, I suppose, like a very small niche radical element of things, um, just bringing words that no one is gonna pay for um, to a different set of readers. Um, and translating some English into Italian um, and yeah, more recently moving into um, board games and role play games and working specifically with uh, people who have uh, certain political ideologies, if not agendas that are more or less implicit or explicit in the, the work that is actually being put out there. Um, so in that sense, even though it's operating within a system that is inherently capitalist, um, there is something that can be done at least in the uh, more abstract or in the more uh, nitty gritty of the process itself. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's more or less how I see that um, conjunction. Well, I'll, I'll circle back to some of those some of those points in a second. Uh, uh, Ali Reza, tell tell us about your relationship with activism as a as a translator and an editor. Well, uh, first, thank you for having me. Um, the fact is that where I come from, I come from Iran. Pen is political. So just if you take off a pen, whether you want to write something, whether you want to translate something, it is considered a weapon. And it has been like this, at least for the modern history. Uh, translators have been viewed as champions of modern thoughts and modern ideologies. And so they were always looked up, looked at as being political activists, even if they just translate literature. But the fact is that uh, since uh, the last revolution of 1906, the Constitutionalist Revolution, that revolution was actually uh, indebted much to the acts of translation because it has started by some intellectuals translating uh, ideas from Western languages, mainly. Uh, French into Persian, ideas like uh, constitutionalism, uh, modern uh, judicial system, which actually led to led up to the revolution. After the revolution of 1979, when I grew up and then I started to enter into translation, again, translation was seen as a dangerous act to do because they were being censored, tortured, even murdered because of the type of books that they choose to publish and to translate. And it has been um, used by many Iranians as a weapon to bring in new ideas and 
sometimes even they disguise their own writing as translation because this can give them a kind of safety. I have done it myself. For example, I remember that I published an article in a widely circulated newspaper. And then there were some main passages that I couldn't say I have written it myself. So I faked a name of a Tunisian writer, Ali Abdullah al Sujani, and I quoted from a fictitious book that didn't exist. So uh, it has always been like this to me. It's not something new. And has, has that particular Tunisian writer, has his work progressed over the years? Has he written other work? <laughs> no, it was just one, one instance for a newspaper article. But there have been people who have written uh, complete books yeah. and even a couple of books named uh, after a non-existent writer. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. It's um, from your point of view, translating uh, from outside into Persian, um, from your point of view, as you say, uh, in that part of the world, you did, p politics isn't a choice. Uh, when you pick up a pen, and perhaps in the West, uh, in, in in quotes, in, perhaps in the English, in certain parts of the English-speaking world, or certain communities within the English-speaking world, politics is a is a is a an indulgence. It's a choice. It's a privilege. Uh, you can choose it, or or you can choose not to be political. And that in itself is is very interesting because if you translate from a part of the world where politics isn't a choice uh, into a part of the world. Uh, lucky enough to say that it is a choice, then you're kind of bringing politics, you're being inherently political. Would you agree, uh, Catherine? Because you, you're writing from, <coughs> you're translating from the Arabic. Yeah, I think um, what Ali Reza says about uh, translation being a weapon to, or it can be a weapon, has the potential to introduce new ideas into society is not only true of Iran, it's that, that can be true anywhere. Translation always has that potential. Um, which is what's so exciting about it for me. Um, and I think, you know, this doesn't just apply to the stuff that is very obviously political with a big P. It can also apply to, you know, kinds of literature which appear on the face of it, of it to be far less, you know, to be far more understated, to be far less obviously political. Um, and certainly I think that if there's any way in which literary translation um, can be a form of activism. I would say that it's in those kinds of texts. Um, and that's the sort of writing I like to work on these days. Um, of course, I still do some of the more obviously political stuff, um, in particular related to Palestine, some things related to kind of queer rights in the Middle East, and of course, Egypt, which is my, you know, kind of second home. Um, but I think... Uh, the kinds of literature I'm interested in at the moment are um, literature that strikes a balance between um, something like a kind of coming to understand the other and also self-discovery, because I think that's what, you know, that's what translated literature, reading literature from other places has the possibility to do. It allows us to see another place and another way of thinking, another, whatever you want to call it, another culture but also in doing so to learn more about ourselves. And I think, I think it's in, in that possibly, you know, quite small, quite um, mild form of activism that, that that potential lies, at least in the realm of literature. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Alex, to, to go back to um, your, two, your two categories, you're saying that the, the process of translation is is political or active, is an activist sort of uh, um, uh, kind of act, um, whilst the actual industry is quite the opposite. Do you want to? Can you pull that apart a little bit and 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 uh, yeah, kind of explain why you think the industry is by definition, you know, um, a conservative entity? Yeah, um, I, I think it's it's become more and more clear that it's not just a conservative, but it's also a reactionary kind of industry. Um, 
even just the idea of how grants are allocated to different publishers, how um, prizes and awards are given to specific writers and how there's been a surge after 2020 of uh, with like publishing so white and all of the various campaigns that uh, more marginalized writers have been pointing out about the industry as it currently existed in that stage. Uh, and it's like everyone's scrambling to publish uh, the next um, next black author and then the whole Amanda Gorman um, squabble that happened within the translation community that reveals just how racist the translation community actually was in the Anglosphere, um, which was very, very, it, it was not surprising, but it was still disappointing. Um, and the misunderstandings that came along with that as well, and, and how, who is allowed to translate what. And as you were saying, um, the idea of countries where writing isn't seen as political necessarily, and the political nature of writing becomes a choice or an indulgence. Um, and that was the, like, everyone was indulging in this conversation while everything else was happening at the same time and it's like the people who were doing the actual translating of political writing as Catherine mentioned or having to turn to translation as Ali Reza was mentioning um, to hide the fact that there was politics happening underneath it um, was being completely ignored because we were talking about celebrities and we were talking about gossip and we were talking about who gets to publish what and who gets money off this and I think that's the issue the issue is it, it always comes down to like how is the labor um, paid? How is how is remuneration considered? Um, and are we are we translating to make money out of something? And that seems to be the case with the big four, big five, big three. Eventually, the big one when yeah. the Simon just a random penguin house will become yeah. a thing. Um, and how you know a lot of the novels. I think every novel except for one that I've done have been with what would have been the big five um and they've all been commissions they've not been things that i've pitched the things that i've pitched have usually gone to someone else which is always interesting um but the usually the the work that we do as translators the work that we like the the, the nitty-gritty the details the do i choose to use a uh, universal masculine to translate something rather than a gender neutral term to translate something. Uh, do I try queering this text in any way that isn't betraying the original, but is just opening it up a little bit? Um, do I choose a text that hasn't been considered before, or, or do I try retranslating a classic that should be reconsidered because it was mistranslated in the first place, or it has was translated in a specific context in the first place? Um, those are all questions that are great to pose. And then the answer usually is, well, if no one's going to publish it for me, then that's it's a lovely thought experiment. Um, but then the book industry decides what comes out, and then the marketing departments decide how the, that book actually makes it onto the market. I think Catherine is is agreeing very vigorously on that point. Is it, is it as bleak as that, Catherine? Uh, is it as bleak as as Alex says, where uh, translators pitch uh, pitch ideas and then they just get ignored, and and the the um, the translator has no way of setting the publishing agenda? Um, interesting. I I would agree with Alex about a lot of those points. Um, I certainly feel that. Yeah, you're talking to talking to me at a moment of frustration about a couple of authors whose work I've been trying to pitch recently, and they are very much authors who who I would describe in the terms I just used, um, mm -hmm. writers who are thinking quite hard about how we live as humans and uh, in relation to our world, to, to our environment, and those ways of thinking might be able to offer something new to Anglophone readers and. Um, I just haven't had any interest, interest for them, uh, at least not yet, so I'm sure I will at some point. Um, so it's a moment of frustration, so that's kind of partly why I'm nodding so vigorously. Um, that said, I do think it gets easier over time to set one's own agenda as a translator over the course of one's career, um, which 
you know, that, that also reflects the fact that, you know, one builds up prestige and the ways that that prestige is built up and assigned are not necessarily fair. There's a lot that needs to be done within the publishing industry to get new people in, um, particularly people who grow up speaking multiple languages, for example, instead of, you know, people who happen to have a university degree that says that language on. There's all sorts of ways in which that kind of system of prestige could and should be disrupted. Um, but I was also reflecting as, Alex was speaking that there's another, I think, quite fundamental tension between the kind of aspirations of activism and the pragmatics of the literary translation world. And that's that activism, good activism, is always collective. And being a literary translator is quite a solitary endeavor. Um, it's one of the things I dislike the most about translation, although, although I, I do love it most of the time. <laughs> Um, but it can be very, very lonely. Um, and there's, you know, when you're, when you're surrounded by a group of people who are all putting their time and energy in because they care about this cause. And so I'm thinking here about my example, the example I gave earlier of, of working on these um, citizen media videos from Egypt. There was such a great group of people, all of whom really cared about it and really wanted to get these, these videos translated and out there. That feeling is, is wonderful. And, it, you know, you lift each other up through that work. Um, and it's got nothing to do with being paid because you're not being paid, right? There's no other incentive other than the, the political and social imperative of getting this stuff out there. When you're translating a book, no matter how committed you feel to, you know, what it's trying to say and you really want people to read it, it's very lonely. The fact that the pay is peanuts feels much more like an insult, even though you don't care about pay at all when you're doing activism. Um, and most often you really don't have people to kind of bounce ideas off, to work with, to infuse with, to encourage and to be encouraged by. Um, and that's, I think, yeah, probably the biggest kind of tension um, between kind of wanting to do this activist work, but having to do it within the confines of the publishing industry as it is. Thank you. Ali Reza, would you agree? Do you, do you find the same frustrations of, of working, working in, a, in a silo on your own, in, in, in isolation? Or is Persian slightly different? Is there more of a sort of collective uh, literary scene? In that well, uh, the, well, the act of translation is, uh, is normally solitary, but there is a difference because I mostly translate into Persian. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between how the translation is viewed in my culture, which is, as I told you, it's, it's always a sort of uh, translator is a respected individual. So it is not always a job. This, this might be a difference. So if, even if you are not paid, you still get the recognition. You still get the fame. Your name is always on the cover. You have the same uh, re reputation and prestige as a writer, the same standing and position. So it's not always, uh, viewed as a career, I mean, especially literary translation. Mm -hmm. What I find, what I find in, in in English, based on my limited experience, the uh, British publication industry, I think it is not adventurous enough. It is still very Eurocentric. If they do uh, publish minority languages or languages which are considered minority. They normally do it as a kind of charity, giving voice to the minority and other cultures. Well, it actually should be otherwise. You, you should look at literature as literature. You should, the way we see it in Iran is that even if we translate from a tiny, small country in the Pacific Ocean, we consider that it enriches our culture. It adds to our language. It adds to our body of literature, but I don't see that approach, at least uh, when it comes to a language like Persian or to that area, that part of the world, which is called the Middle East. Well, I call it West Asia, mm -hmm. but the Eurocentric vision sees it as the Middle East. So that type of idea, uh, yes, has, has been a little bit frustrating. And the fact that some uh, the, the fact that translation uh, is seen by many just as a job always makes it more difficult because there are people who have the passion and who might be willing to give 
that passion into literature and not to care about the money that it earns, but they don't get anything. They don't even get the recognition. They don't even get the social uh, prestige that comes with it in, in my case. So they just don't do it mm-hmm. and they don't get the uh, publication. So uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered. Yeah, no, absolutely. There is a there is a huge problem, and, and Catherine picked up on this as well. That um, in a in a city like Manchester, uh, there's over two two hundred different languages spoken, uh, but within that bilingual, multilingual communities, there's very very few people working in translation at all. Which is one of the reasons why we set up this this conference. In, in fact, Alex, I could see you reacting uh, to uh, Ali Reza's point about giving voice. The very phrase we give voice. Yeah. It's, giving voice to the voiceless is the yeah, it's so uh, one of the yeah it's one of the um and I, I say this being fully conscious of being a white man uh talking on the internet um but the it, it's it's white saviorism in its literary form um it's it's voluntourism it's um these poor other people uh, these poor others with a capital o uh, that we have to bring into english and and for some reason, we have warped the idea of, as Ali Reza was saying, the translation becoming a process that enriches the language and the culture where it arrives is seen now as English, predominantly English, um, is saving yeah. otherwise unrecognized, unacknowledged writers who, you know, um, this happened all, didn't happen all the time. No, it happened in a big way with uh, Korean, for example, when Deborah Smith first translated Han Kang's Vegetarian um, and how everyone suddenly discovered that Korea was a place that existed um, because no one had translated that much Korean literature into English until this big case came up and people who didn't understand anything about it still tried saying something about it. And I'm not gonna make any names here, but um, we are all aware. I think people in the translation community are aware of the big kerfuffle that came out of that um but yeah the this uh, this saviorism complex of giving voice to the voiceless and that is something that can happen as catherine was mentioning like the work that you do with journalism the work that you do with actual like campaigning activism that is that is probably the the benign form of the giving the voice to the voiceless that is amplifying a message it is uh handing the tools and the instruments and the soapbox to someone else who doesn't have that particular tool that you have that you can give them which is not the same when it's saving as Ali Reza was saying this small pacific uh, small country in the middle of the pacific we're not giving them a voice they have their voice they're writing already in in their voice um it's maybe we can learn something from it maybe that 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 should be the way that we think of translation thank you um a lot of what I want to talk about today is, is optimism. Um, and I'm going to ask the optimism question several different ways because we're a bit short of it at the moment. Um, so my first optimism question is, uh, have, you, have you seen, have you felt that publishing as an industry is improving? Uh, Alex, I, I can sense from your previous answers that maybe it's not, but is there an element of, uh, is, has it become more radical? Have readers become more more radical or more inclusive or more uh, proactive in their tastes um, over the years uh, since since you've 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 all started as translators? Do you feel that trends are um, are kind of um, are, are reasons for for optimism in this area? I'm going to ask uh, Catherine first because you're all being shy. I mean, questions about optimism are tough to answer at a time like this, I think, which is why I was kind of staring into the distance thinking about what I was going to say. Um, I'm very heartened by the work of lots of independent publishers, um, among them Plummer. I think there are loads of really interesting translated books coming out that have got really quite reasonable amounts of of coverage and interest, thanks to the work of, you know, small publishers who are putting lots of effort in to finding these new writers and getting coverage for them and making their works available in English. Um, So that's definitely a heartening sign. I don't feel like I've been doing this long enough to have an overview of whether that's kind of like a really a big change over time. Um, 
I'm not sure. I certainly feel that translation is quite sexy these days. I think translation is very trendy. There's kind of um, a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of interest in translation, I think, as a craft and in translated literature. What I don't find heartening is that in the UK, at least, which is where, you know, we're having this conversation, um, language teaching and the arts have just been decimated by austerity, by this awful conservative government. Um, I think we live in a deeply racist society. So the same issue that we were talking about before um, that Ra brought up about Manchester is true across the country. There is so mm -hmm. much talent, just if we're talking about language and translation, there's so much talent in you know young people who are whatever speaking two or three languages at home, but that's not valued in the places where they study. They quite possibly can't even study that subject at university and they are not the people that, um, I don't know, literary magazines, publishers, other employers in the world of translation are looking to, to find out about literature or to cultivate new talent in literary translation. And the kind of damage that has been done to the education system in the UK in this regard is going to take years to repair. So that makes me feel not optimistic at all. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it isn't just a kind of question of window dressing. The, the question of like having a diversity of people who do translation is also about, you know, the kinds of the, the kinds of material that gets translated and the quality of the stuff that gets translated. Um, I, I suppose I don't, I don't want to like wade into a debate of like native speaker, non-native speaker, but it's really important to have people from a kind of variety of backgrounds doing translation. People who've studied languages at universities, people who've spoken those languages all, all their lives since they, you know, since they were born. Um, and I don't think we have that kind of diversity at the moment, and that does have an impact on, on the quality of translation. So I think a mixed mixed bag from my yeah. point of view. Okay. Ali Reza, well, uh, do, do you feel the market's changed or it read uh, interests have changed in the UK or, or, in, or in Iran? Well, uh, in the case of UK, um, I don't feel I'm the best candidate to answer this, but I second Catherine on because I have the same kind of feeling that independent press are doing a very good job. There's another element of uh, in online publishing and self-publishing, which has definitely diversified the publishing industry and has added the, the potential. But I have my own reservations because it, uh, as Katzin was saying, uh, sometimes it compromises the quality and the professionalism that's needed from translators, especially from literary translators. And it's also even, even with professional uh, publishers, sometimes uh, I see the, at least in the case of Persian literature that I read and I compare, I can sometimes see that the, uh, the choice of the books to translate has not been done quite well. So poor works have been chosen to be translated because someone knew someone and someone knew someone else, not because of a thorough knowledge of the period or the time that they were going to focus. So the quality of translations is perfect sometimes, but the choice is poor. So this is uh, my feeling based on the limited number of works that are translated from Persian into English. Um, but in the case of uh, Iran or transition into Persian, yes, it has been improving a lot. Uh, first of all, because of the long record of translation, it has always been a very important element in the publication industry in Iran. It might be surprising to you that uh, you can sell or pitch your translation much more easily then you can sell a written a book that you wrote yourself. So translators get published very easily. They, they earn much more than writers, even than good writers, mm -hmm. because there is this idea that uh, everyone buys translated books. And it's also less censored than the book domestically produced. So that also adds to the allure of the 
uh, translated material. And uh, yes, it has been, we have had uh, more people, especially female translators entering into this job in Iran, which is great. And more people who consider it as a lifelong career and they actually earn a good living, which is also a bonus. Okay, <clears throat> Alex. Can I add um, something? I think that's I think that's so interesting. What that that Ali does. I just brought up gender because, um, it, you know, translation. I think is feels like a really um, majority uh, female profession in in my experience in at least in the UK, um, mm -hmm. perhaps across Europe more generally, but certainly in the UK, a lot of my you know literary translator colleagues are female, and I think it's so interesting that. That in a country where you say literary translators have enjoy a lot more prestige, it's much more of a, a male profession. And yeah, I think those things are, are not unconnected. Um, so thanks for raising that. Thank you. Alex, you were um, do you wanna do you wanna just yeah, uh, yeah. Have, a go, have a go at publishers? Because I know uh, <laughs> but you, you've, um, very, you've all been very kind about independence, but come on, tell us what you really feel about publishers. Yeah, well, the 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 thing that I'm going to latch on, uh, like other than the point that Catherine was just making on on building on what Ali Reza just said about um, about um, gender and prestige, uh, that is something that yes, like even though in the UK, in in the Anglo sphere specifically, um, or more in general rather, sorry, my words are mixed up now. Um, the the percentage of people who work in translation tend to be non-male and there is a very very limited but growing and this is where the optimism is coming there is a growing uh, gender non-conforming non-binary and genderqueer like component also emerging very very timidly because of the also in some ways conservative um constituency of the translator block uh, like we there's only like 200 of us and we all know each other and we, we've all read each other's names at some point even if we don't know each other's like directly but if you work with a specific language pair you will come across most of your colleagues that work either into the US into Australia New Zealand into Canada or into the UK um, but the, the 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 one the thing that I wanted to pick up on is um, sorry so yes even though most of the people who are translating books are not men the people who are receiving most of the prestige and people like the classics. And when we talk about, ah, the art of translation is mostly men. Um, it is mostly uh, the, you know, it's the classics of it, it, the big scandal, the big moment was when the Odyssey was translated by a woman into English for the first time, when like most Italian translations of the Odyssey have been done by women and it's never been a big deal. Not to say that Italy has a particularly stellar track record with um, gender treatment in any way whatsoever, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, but the other point that I wanted to go into was to answer your question more directly, Ra. Um, you mentioned like, oh, is there any optimism about how translation is going? And you mentioned things like market and trend. Um, and the industry. And I feel like those words do not work well with optimism because as I mentioned earlier, um, after 2020, there has been a trend with a lot of uh, major publishers trying to publish the new big black, um, black Lives Matter response to whatever was happening in the world in literature. And then that's it. <laughs> We've done it. We've published a couple of black people. We have a couple of essays and, you know, Roxane Gay is now doing her own thing. And we have like, we're ignoring all of spec fic, science fiction and fantasy that have been doing all of this for a long time uh, because no one reads those books, except those are the books that everyone is reading. Um, and the, whatever the new trend is, like I, I'm actually not aware of what the new trend is because I, the, the language pair that I work with is now focused mostly on family sagas and historical novels uh, like Elena Ferrante and anything that can come with Elena Ferrante that looks a little bit like Elena Ferrante is kind of what gets both what gets pitched from Italy into English and what arrives into English from Italy. And that seems to be the case with a lot of um, like Korean literature now, right now is having a big moment in terms of uh, queer narratives and female narratives and, and queer female narratives. Um, and it does tend to be 
going into a somewhere between auto fiction and what Ali Reza was mentioning about like self publication and the people who start with self publication and then find a uh, an actual editor like someone who actually does editing as a job and then moves it into publishing and from there eventually makes it into translation. Um, but I think that without the work of the translators, without the work that a lot of translators are doing to get these books into translation in the first place, even just like showing what books are out there, uh, that would not be possible. Um, I don't think it's not to diminish the idea and the role of the scout or of the uh, the agent or of the just the work that publishers do in general, but most of the time, a lot of the time, it is translators who are doing those three jobs at the same time as translating the work that they're trying to get through. Uh, it's just like, as I said, like I've pitched a couple of novels, several novels, and other translators have got them, which is great. Those books are coming through in translation. But publishers have not heard of those books in the first place, um, even though those are probably the books that would be more interesting. Um, and third, very quickly, in terms of optimism, as I said, there is a rise in terms of people who are working outside of the gender binary, people who are working from different backgrounds, people who are um, entering translation or being revealed to have always been there in translation, um, especially in the wake of 2020. Um, but that's also happening among readerships. Uh, like People are being made aware of the fact that Audiences like to read different things. We don't all want to read about another university professor having an affair with the third wife and two kids in the periphery of a big city in the UK. But the second home was in Cornwall. Um, that, you know, after Ian McEwan invented sci-fi a couple of years ago and Katsuo Shiguro invented fantasy a couple of years ago, um, we've kind of moving away from those narratives, but the readers were ready and I think a lot of publishers still assume that being too risky and being like not wanting to be influenced by the translation culture and that I think that's that's quite a stark difference with what Ali Reza was saying with like Iran recognizing translation as being something more prestigious than literature sometimes. Um, in the UK you kind of have to hide that it's a translation. It, it's, it, they don't like to show it too much unless it's the translator of Elena Ferrante or the translator of someone famous in another context. And like, oh, this is the next big Scandinavian. But we all know Joe Nez, but we don't know Don Bartlett. And it's not just the invisibility of the translator. It's also the fact that if you don't know the translator, you don't have to pay them. Um, they're not, they're not going to complain if they're never acknowledged. Uh, but we do complain a lot. <laughs> we love to complain. Thank you. Um, we're also uh, opening this up to questions uh, on YouTube. So if anybody has any questions, please fire, fire away. Um, there's one question specifically for you, Ali Reza, about the Iranian uh, industry. Um, Iran sits uh, officially outside of the Berne Convention on Copyright. Um, so I just wondered if, um, so the question was really about how uh, copyright affects you as a translator uh, and, and the industry you work in. Is it, uh, is it more prohibitive? Uh, um, in terms of what gets uh, what what gets paid for, or is it uh, does it kind of free you up as a translator? And does it free up the industry, or um, is that am I misrepresenting uh, the the copyright situation? There? Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, no, you are absolutely right. It is uh, a big issue, and it has been debated. Every, every year in the International Book Fair, there is normally a debate around copyright. Uh, some publishers prefer it as it is because they don't have to pay anything and they can easily publish uh, uh, foreign um, publications. But there are many publishers, especially those who are more established, who would like to have the copyright because uh, firstly, there, are the, there is the economic factor. Sometimes you see a book which is being published and in a matter of maybe one or two months, you have 20 different translations of the same book because it's a best-selling best uh, title. And then suddenly all publishers want to translate it. And uh, therefore, the, 
the, the ministry which issues licenses, they have come up with a plan to register the book that you are doing uh, in advance so that the other uh, transitors can see that you are uh, doing this. But even this doesn't help because uh, the, it can prevent uh, double translation. So this is one problem. The other problem is that many, many, many translators, especially translators, they prefer to get the copyright because they think firstly, this is the right thing to do. And secondly, because they want to have a, a good relationship with the publishers overseas so that if they translate something back into foreign languages, they can be respected the same. But uh, the reason they haven't done this yet, the reason that the government has not joined copyright yet, I think, I assume it's because the number of books that, trans that gets translated into Persian hugely outnumber the number translated from Persian into other languages. So there is this economic imbalance. If they want to have the copyright, then they would have to pay huge amounts of copyright, but they would get very little in return. This, this might be uh, one reason, but uh, I can say that the, it is a matter of a continuous debate and one solution that some publishers and some translators have found is that they contact the copyright holder and they say that, okay, Iran is not a member of copyright, but just out of courtesy, we would like to ask for your permission, which is usually granted, but sometimes denied. But anyway, it's at least it's a polite way uh, to, to do. And many, many translators are now doing this and they write it. If they have the permission in the preface, they mentioned that this was published with the permission of the author or the copyright holder uh, or the copyright was purchased anyway. I just want to say that I love the idea of a society that's so desperate to read translated books that like five translations of the same thing are appearing simultaneously. That sounds amazing. <laughs> it does. Uh, thank you, Eliza. Um, there's been a question really for, for everyone. You've, you've all sort of mentioned, uh, or, or a couple of you have mentioned uh, writers that you've had difficulty finding uh, English language publishers for. Um, do you want to uh, uh, do you want to name uh, them or give a shout out to uh, particular writers that you're, you've, you've struggled to find uh, English, English uh, publishers for? Um, or do you, do you want to talk about writers that you've had difficulties finding uh, finding a publisher for and you've eventually succeeded in? I'll, I'll gladly give a shout out to some writers. Um, uh, one mm. writer whose work I think is absolutely fantastic is a Syrian writer called Dresha Abbas. Um, I haven't worked on any of her books. Um, there is a book of hers that's doing the rounds, hopefully, hopefully will come out at some point soon, translated by my colleague Alice Guthrie. Um, and that book is called The Gist of It. It's a book of short stories, but I have had the pleasure of, of translating one of the stories from that book and also translating some other material from that book for a theater production that's just, um, in fact, it's still showing here in Berlin, um, which is where I live. She's a brilliant writer. Her, she's got quite a kind of unusual voice. It's very, very distinctive. You know, it's her when she's writing. Um, it's a little bit punk, the stories kind of could take place anywhere, but some of them also have quite a Syrian feel or a Syrian setting. And I think they're kind of just wonderful. Um, you know, she does that thing that I was talking about of, yes, I mean, when you read about it, you do sort of learn something about Syria, if that's what you were looking for, but you also think about yourself and you also think about life and the world and, and humans. And I think writers like that are really important for kind of you know, bucking this trend of typecasting that Alex is talking about, you know, the Elena Franti for Italy, the, you know, the vegetarian for Korea. Don't even get me started on the typecasting of like Arab writers, especially Arab female writers. Um, so she's somebody who, yeah, um, I would love to see her work published. Um, another writer who, whose work I adore and who's, who I work with a lot is called Haytham Wardeni. He's Egyptian and that's the book that Ra mentioned I want to grant to translate um, last year. Um, 
maybe just to give you an example, I've just had a short story uh, published by him last last month in uh, an online magazine, actually based in Lebanon, not you know not based in in Europe. But that's it's a wonderful story about a migrant worker in Berlin, an Iraqi guy who suddenly finds that his arm is paralyzed, and <laughs> then finds a new arm floating in the canal, and this arm helps him continue to go about his daily life, and the premise is weird of course but it ends up being an incredibly powerful reflection on some very specific kind of local things that happened in berlin recently particularly the opening of the humboldt forum which was a very controversial um it's a it's a re rebuilt prussian palace on the site of the east uh former east german uh government parliament building which is obviously just like a short story just begging to be written isn't it so it's, it's about that it's about the history of how Berlin as a city was built and it's about how we live in relation to our history and the geography around us and I think it's just um, you know that's very characteristic of Python's work asking us to think about European history um, about our relationships with other places and with the places we live in and the environment we live in so those are two amazing writers who I advise you all to go and look up if you're not familiar with them already. Thank you, Catherine. Alex, do you want to, do you want to um, give a shout yeah. out? Yeah, um, there's a, a number of, not necessarily people that I've been trying to um, get published, but people that I think should be uh, considered anyway. Um, I, I, I'll be, I've started recently working with the European Literature Network um, with a monthly column on like, spotlights of books that should make it at some point, or at least take a look. Um, um, that's not a plug to me, it's, it's a plug to all the books that will sh eventually show up in this column. And I think uh, coming out of Italy, literally reconsidering how we see the Italian canon of family sagas, which some of them are great. Um, some of them are, some of the best books in Italy are family sagas, but I think there's a, a sort of bucking the trend of what is currently happening in Italy and actually moving into um, both like Italian writers who whose first language is not necessarily Italian, uh, or people who um, are not recognized as citizens of Italy, but have been in Italy all of their life, uh, and people who are second, third generation, um, come from a migrant background or come from a um, out of Italy background. Um, and then Disha Yangoda, who has written for Open Democracy, for Galdem, uh, she writes both in Italian and English. Um, and she has so far produced uh, one book of nonfiction, uh, several articles and works mostly in podcasting and just like uh, media curation. Um, Jonathan Batsy, who will be published with Scribe Australia, I believe, um, Scribe UK and, and the Australian Italian, uh, the, sorry, the Australian UK uh, combination is, is a weird one, but they, they publish in both countries. Uh, yes, will be published by Alice Whitmore is the translator who is a, an Australian um, activist, actually feminist activist who works a lot with um, um, Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Indigenous um, writers in Australia as well. Um, People such as uh, Esperanza Cusumana, um, whose book will be coming out in September, I believe. Um, like her first novel is coming out in September, but um, has her first her first book was nonfiction with an autobiographical slant. The her first novel is going to be fictionalized, kind of autobiographical, but not quite. Uh, but will be coming out in September. Um, there are a lot of people working in comics in Italy who are really interesting to follow. Uh, Zero Calcare has been the big hit over the past couple of months after a Netflix series was made based on one of his first comics. Um, if you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. It has a very, very interesting um, periphery, outskirt sort of neighborhoods that are not the central city of Italy that you might imagine, um, and a very working class um, not from the author himself, just the, the surroundings that he finds himself in, um, and a very, um, we call it the antagonist left, um, I guess lefty would be the, the English version of it, um, very lefty spaces of yeah. the um, cultural clubs or social clubs, but the Italian version, which are known as the, um, the house of the people. Um, and the social centers and the uh, the people that, that the scapegoats when whenever something wrong happens is like we follow the anarchist um, path and it's usually them 
And it's like, who, who are them? We don't exist. You know, you know how you blame Antifa for everything? Well, it's, it's the same thing. Um, but he, he works within those spheres and he's, he's quite outspoken politically um, and he's done some really good stuff. And uh, Jamie Richards has translated some of his work. Um, and I can't remember who the translator for the bigger books is, but I believe is a UK translator. Um, and yeah, I've just worked looking at what comics and speculative fiction are doing in Italy, um, I think is, is a good, good start. Thank you. Aliraza, are there any uh, Persian Iranian writers that you uh, think absolutely must be translated but haven't been yet into English? Oh, yeah. yeah uh, to be honest, there has been so little translated from Persian into English that I don't know what to name because <laughs> there are many. Uh, there, there are some very great writers who have published uh, 20, 30 novels but none of them has been translated. Uh, even some European countries have done much better than UK and the English language in this regard. There are a couple of writers who have been translated into German and they have made it, they have made it, they have their good names in German uh, publication industry now, but they are not translated into English. Or I know that uh, there is one publisher in Italy who has shown some interest in younger generation uh, novelists and short story writers, and they have done quite a good number. But the frustration for Persian writers to be translated into English has been so huge that some of them have started to write in English. So those who, uh, those who learned English, those who knew English, and they used to write in Persian, are now writing in English. At least two of them, I know that they have their, they had their novels published this year. One of them is Amir Aryan, and the other one is Ali Reza Tahiri Aravi. And both of them were published in, in the US, but they started to, they, they wrote English, in English, which was probably difficult for them, had it edited and all that. While I know them personally, and they would have been probably happier if they could be sure that when, when it is written in Persian, they can get a good translation into English. So if, if I want to suggest someone, probably I would like uh, to look at the other, uh, Euro look at the European languages to start with, see who is translated there and been successful, like Amir Hassan Cheheltan and Mahmoud Dolatawadi. In German, they have been doing well. But uh, I would also recommend Persian short stories because Iranian short story during the past four decades has been exceptionally good. And I'm making, I'm claiming this compared with the short story in English. Maybe not very good in novel, but definitely very good short story writers. Uh, if I want to name some novelists that I personally enjoy their work, I can name Reza Zangiabadi, uh, Hadi Taghizadeh, uh, Farkhonde Agayi, uh, Basim Kashkuli, um, Abu Turab Khosravi. Yeah, they, they are all, they have all written very good books. Thank you, and a little shout out to the uh, the Book of Tehran, an anthology of short stories from uh, Iran that Kama published a few years ago, including Ali Reza's translation, uh, edited by Farishti Um So we've just got time for one last question, and it's it going to have to be a really quick one, but thank you uh, again, everyone, so much for, for today. Um, if you were to give one piece of advice really, really quickly to uh, a translator wanting to uh, express their activism and their political sensibilities through uh, through their work, what what piece of advice would you give give them with regard to setting their agenda, um, or yeah, making making the greatest impact possible through their translation? And I'm gonna I'm gonna volunteer someone, uh, Catherine. I'm gonna ask you first. Sorry. I always keep having to go first. That's okay. I think I would just say find something that you really care about and get stuck in. Um, you know, in, if you end up working as a translator, you'll have to translate an awful lot of mediocre things that you don't really care about, which is just the nature of the beast. So 
if you want to dedicate yourself to you know a more activist practice then find the things that you care about and just read as much as you can find the things that are important to you and then work at them um it will always take time to you know get these things into english to get magazines or publishers interested but you'll probably get there eventually <laughs> and good luck that's my other piece of advice <laughs> thank you alex I was trying to remember who said this, um, that I, I, I heard someone say this, but um, harness the powers of selling for good instead of for evil. Um, so in the same vein of what Catherine was saying, find something that you're really interested in and just sell the living daylights out of it to someone who will uh, take it, even not selling it necessarily to a publisher, just selling it to an audience, just tell them like this, this is something you should care about, you should care about this thing. Um, don't expect to make a career out of it. Uh, like my advice to you, a translator is, well, the easiest advice to a translator who wants to be an activist is don't uh, be an activist. Don't be like, don't expect those two things to necessarily go together as Catherine was saying. Um, but there are ways in which you can make it work. It's just don't expect, don't expect to save the world through books, even though books might just save us. Thank you. And Ali Reza, what advice would you give to a young uh, translator? Yeah, well, a uh, young translator, if, especially if they feel uh, that they belong to a minority class or group of people or an immigrant family, I think anything that they translate would be good and would serve a purpose to show our shared humanity. So when we, when we, when we translate, especially when we translate literature, we bring in the otherness out of the other. So we uh, familiars, familiarize ourselves with the thing that was previously considered other. We see that, okay, that culture, those people are the same as us. They live, they eat, they love. They are human beings. They are not just numbers. Or in the case of the Middle East where I come from, they are not just barrels of oil or numbers who can be killed by bullets as the media tries to tries to trust depict it so yeah just just to translate whatever you like and it would be a good act fantastic thank you a perfect note to end on uh, thank you again thank you everybody for joining us uh, do tune in uh, tomorrow um, where the, the panel discussion will be uh, about um, working as a, as a writer and a creator as well as being a translator. Uh, but for now, please, please join me in thanking our three guests, uh, Catherine Holes, Alex uh, Valente and uh, uh, Ali Reza uh, Ali. Uh, thank you so much again. And uh, I um, yeah, look forward to seeing you again. Cheers. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.